Great. All right. Well, um, th thanks, everyone. My name is uh, Jesse Tut, and I lead the Alberta Health Services AI uh, COP. Um, thanks so much for joining. Um, uh, super happy to have uh, uh, Russ here today. Uh, Russ is a professor uh, with the U of A. Um, he ended up getting his uh, PhD from uh, uh, from Stanford. He worked in both academic and industrial research uh, and finally landed uh, at, the, at the University of Alberta where he is the professor in, in uh, computing science and also founded uh, the organization Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, uh, which is, is well renowned. Um, He's very distinguished, has done some really interesting research, um, and has published over 250 uh, papers, also has patents. Um, so uh, a great background, super excited to have the, uh, the, uh, to see the presentation and uh, really appreciative, appreciative that he's, uh, he's made the time to, to join us. Um, so we will probably do um, uh, the uh, presentation and kind of hold uh, questions to the end, but if you have a question, certainly pop it in the, in the chat window and we'll We'll go for there, uh, uh, from there. Um, thanks so much. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me. Um, is my volume okay right now? Is this? My... Sounds great. Okay. So I'm going to talk about towards patient-specific treatment, medical applications, and machine learning. Let me start by just observing, as most people in the audience probably know, these are really exciting times to be working in this area. Uh, there's work like Chesnut that diagnoses pneumonia better than human radiologists using deep learning techniques from colleagues at Stanford. There's a tool which is now actually a one FDA approval to help diagnose heart problems. It's been cleared to actually be used in practice. There's a tool by Google, Google's affiliate DeepMind that can detect acute kidney injuries, uh, often two days before standard symptoms done by people at DeepMind Health. There's a tool which was developed in China that helps diagnose brain tumors that can produce, predict hematoma expansion. And they had a competition that did better than 15 um, senior physical clinicians in this task. There's also a system called Babylon, which I just learned is actually going to be available through TELUS in, in uh, Alberta in the next few months. That's designed to make accessible and affordable health care in the hands of the very person on, on Earth. Um, a, a patient describes symptoms, this tool then asks relevant questions, produces likely diagnosis and identifies a course of actions and related risk factors, which can then be communicated to a human clinician to make a final decision, but does some of the preliminary work. These are real systems deployed and available right now. This is really exciting work. It's not just in these splashy demos. If you look at a PubMed and put in the mesh terms machine learning, you'll find an exponential rise in number of projects, some 38,000 citations that, to papers that include machine learning in the title or keywords. Look at that expansion. That's worldwide in Edmonton too, these things are happening. I look at my personal trajectory over the last 15 or so years, you can see that I, I've been also going through a few different tasks and guys more and more than a year ago, I was on sabbatical, and I started answering the cold call, cold calls for a whole variety of different tasks where people have come to me and said, uh, I've heard about you. I'm going to talk like this one, for example, and I got really excited. Can you help me look at survival for kidney donors or, or lethal arrhythmias or um, most effective personalized cannabis strains? Can you help me with some medical tasks along these lines? <clears throat> so there's been successes. In, in medical applications, partly because it's been successful in other areas. And companies like Google and Yahoo and Microsoft and Netflix and Amazon and so forth. These are world-class com companies that have made billions of dollars by using machine learning as core technologies. Our focus, of course, will be just on medical applications. Quick overview. So far, I've given just motivation. I'm going to talk about learning to predict breast cancer as a breast cancer relapse, I'm sorry, as a way to try to understand some of the basic ideas comparing correlation versus prediction. That will segue into a machine learning 101. I'll give a quick, quick overview of some of the basic types of algorithms and talk about a critical task of evaluation, all in the context of this one application. As time permits, um, I'll talk about other learning tasks applied to medical applications and other topics. 
So we're here now. I'm going to talk about learning to predict breast cancer relapse. So I was fortunate to talk to John Mackey and manager of Pazdar a, a few, well, many, many years ago. And they gave me, a computer scientist, a quick overview of cell adhesion and what goes into that. And again, I apologize, this is my layperson's misunderstanding of the area. But as I understand things, <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of proteins that stick out of a cell wall that serve to hold, hold tissues together. These are the hedron catenin complexes. And their job is basically to be on the perimeter of a cell and to zip the different cells together. And when they're disrupted, these components, first, they're no longer zipping the cell together and the, so the cells can move to other tissue, can leave the tissues. But also these proteins in these complexes move to the cytoplasm and into the nucleus and they interfere with growth regulatory proteins in complicated ways and modify their function. And they might trigger metastasis. So not just are they holding the cell together, uh, tissue together, I'm sorry, they also might help transform the cell to go rogue and lead to cancer elsewhere in the body. Bad idea. So the question they came to me with was, suppose we told you, Russ, the location of these junctional proteins within a breast cancer tumor cell prior to treatment, can we then predict which patients will have an early relapse because the metastasis or other problems? And if we knew this, well, that could help a clinician decide what treatments might be best for a particular patient, patient-specific treatment, but also might help identify markers and pathways and so, and so forth. So that was a question. How do I play the game? What's the next step? This is my world. <clears throat> my world has these matrices in them. So there's, in this case, there were 66 patients, and every patient was described with some 30 features. These 30 features included these canhedra mediated adhesion complexes. So for each of these six different types of proteins, where were they? Were they um, uh, in the nucleus, in the cell wall, or, or the cell membrane? Were they doing their job, or were they going rogue and going elsewhere? So we had locations in terms of some uh, simple numbers for, for locations. So those were 18 of the 30 features. There was also 12 other characteristics, the age and the size of the tumor, age of the woman, size of tumors, and other sort of celebrity proteins, you know, like the total concentrations of P10 and so forth. So that was the description of the data. One more feature was the outcome. These are historical patients. We knew who had a relapse within three years. So all breast cancer patients, some relapsed and some did not. That was the data we had to work with. What do you do with this data? Well, one thing you can do is you could do an association or correlation study. So what gene should I knock out next is a medically relevant question. So here I might, for example, compute the correlation of each feature, each one of these columns with the outcome and get numbers. You know, I can translate these to p-values if you want, but things with high correlation are things which are likely to be related, we think, to the actual disease or, or, the, or the prognosis. And maybe that suggests the next study to run, you know, what to knock out, what to amplify, other environments you might be able to change. So that's one thing you can do. <clears throat> and again, I'm going to give a caricature this is a caricature, and I apologize to biostatisticians in the audience. Uh, this is just to give different, different foci. Uh, biostatistics, much of that work, looks at this type of question, associations and correlations, uh, that try to figure out, is a protein linked to the outcome? By contrast, the machine learning approach is asking about building predictors. Can I predict the outcome for a novel patient? Here's a new patient. What happens to this individ individual? So instead of what gene should I knock out, <clears throat> the question could be for a new patient, the patient may ask, will it relapse? And the clinician can give an answer. Yes, or hopefully the answer is no, it will not, it will not have a relapse. But a correct answer that you can use to base treatments or decisions on that point. So <clears throat> how would you do this? Well, you could build a simple classifier looking at one feature. So one feature could be, for example, a number of lymph nodes. You build a classifier that says if there's you know, one or more lymph nodes, predict relapse, otherwise predict no relapse. That's one classifier you could imagine. 
but there's 30 features I could look at. The beta catenin, the concentration of beta catenin in the nucleus, and build a model for that, or maybe based on the tumor size. Let me point out um, that for later that for beta catenin, the, cor the correlation is essentially zero, right? So this would not be an important feature. I'm going to come back to that later on. Remember, beta catenin nucleus was not important at this point. But I can imagine age of diagnosis or contact of P10 and give correlation scores for all these different features. So I could look at one feature, but why one feature? I've got 30. Can I combine them and build an answer from combinations? So again, continuous caricature, <coughs> uh, whereas much of biostatistics looks at correlation, much of biostatistics also looks at univariate analysis. What single feature is most correlated with the outcome? And machine learning, supervised machine learning, looks at predictors, but also multivariate analysis. Again, there are biostatisticians who do a wonderful job at building predictive models. And machine learning also looks at other issues. But just as this caricature, I'm going to focus on this multivariate analysis to produce a predictor. <clears throat> so the goal here is, again, here's my novel patient. Here are the 30 characteristics I talked about earlier for this individual. We want a classifier that takes these 30 characteristics and comes back with an answer. Yes, or I hope the answer is no. Oops. <clears throat> How do we do this? Well, it'd be great if medical science had reached a point now where we understand exactly how alpha catenin in, this, in the cytoplasm interacts with P10 and causes some, some interaction that leads to something for women who are postmenopausal. And here's a whole model of the world. That would be wonderful. I approve of, you know, following science and trying to understand that process. We're not there now. Right now, we don't know all the interaction. We have hypotheses and conjectures, but we don't really know how things work at this level for, for this disease or for many other diseases either. How do we produce this classifier that can identify which, what will happen next to this individual? Well, now, remember that data set I had earlier. We have historical patients. But for these patients, we knew what happened. Can we use this type of data to produce a classifier? And that's what machine learning algorithm does. It provides learning tools that take data sets like this and produce not biomarkers, but combinations of characteristics that collectively lay me to build a classifier. And that classifier, once deployed, can then answer questions about new individuals. I guess the, normally there's an audience, I'll say everyone tracking, but I'm going to assume people are, I'll keep going. So how do you use all these features? Well, we try to find patterns, relationships. What do they look like? Well, let me make it easier. Imagine there was two features. There's age of diagnosis and number of lymph nodes. And again, this is a made-up example. And I've got characteristics. And every patient here had no relapse in three years. And these patients did have a relapse in three years. And so every one of these is a patient defined by these two characteristics, number of lymph nodes and age of diagnosis. And now if there's a new patient like this one, um, again, if there's an audience, I'd ask for a show of hands. Who thinks this patient will be relapsed versus not? But I'll give the answer away. I, I think most people would agree that this label is going to be positive. It will be a relapse. And why? Well, it feels like it. I mean, look, all the neighbors, all the ones in this area of the, area of the world have relapsed. It would be really surprising this would be minus because of all the environment, all the other patients like that. This is an educated guess. It's not based on a definitive test or a postmortem, but I still think most people in the audience would agree that if this is what the world was like, you would probably make a decision, so treatments based on this. So that's a simple example. Now, if the world was that easy, I wouldn't have a job, right? It's a trivial case, two dimensions, well-defined separation. <laughs> what about this case? Imagine the data looked like this. Is this patient positive or negative? Well, you can tell a story that kind of goes this way as positive, or maybe a story like this is negative, and you can tell all sorts of stories. It's not obvious. And really, you know, given just this data and these simple models, it'd be hard to know what the right answer should be in this case. Of course, that's two dimensions. What if you had higher dimensions? What if three dimensions? And now you have different features that all interact, you know, age and two different blood tests and how they interact. It's not clear so all. That's three dimensions. I can still visualize it, kind of. Remember the data I just showed you? There was 30 dimensional. I challenge you to think of what a 30 dimensional model would look like. How would you use that? 
And now I'm going to show about data sets which have 50,000 50, dimensional, or another data set with 7 million dimensional. You can't visualize that. You need other tools. But the good news is the same tools that apply to two dimensional things scale up and apply to higher dimensions. We'll talk about some of those. So okay, I'm going, I keep wanting to ask the audience are people tracking, but I'm going to just keep, keep going. Um, let me go through a machine learning 101 and talk about three different algorithms, very, very simplistically described, and then talk about evaluation, which is a critical component. So the first class of algorithms, most obvious ones, are linear separated. Linear means straight line, and separated means it separates them. But I assume people, people are seeing me also. I, I move my hands. People are seeing that? OK, I'm going to assume so. So a linear a separating line, so in this case, a line is pretty easy, right? It's just uh, a vertical line, axis parallel line. And now you say if there's more than 1.5 lymph nodes, then predict relapse positive. So that's easy. But these lines could be angled, can be sloped. And now the only math in the whole, the whole talk is just the equation for a straight line in, in a high dimensional, in any space, is a linear combination of features. So this line could be, for example, look at number of lymph nodes, multiply it by negative 2.3, add 7.5, I'm sorry, the age of diagnosis times negative 2.3, add 7.5 times number of lymph nodes, and add 1.2. If that's equal to zero, that's the equation for this line. If this is quantity, if this summation of linear combination of the features for a patient, if that's greater than zero, it's positive, less than zero, and it's negative. So I'm saying over here. So if this is greater than zero, predict relapse. So that's a linear separator. It's a very intuitive notion, just that it just separates nicely. Plus here, minus there. And whether it's two dimensions or three dimensions or ten or, or seven million dimensional, the same idea applies. You can find lines separates them. So given many features, it's just a linear combination. I think I'll show the next slide. So here's a game. <clears throat> you have a bunch of features. Uh, there's a learning process that produces these weights. And now for a given patient, a patient comes in with these characteristics, and I just I take 1 times 2.3 plus 35 times negative 7.5, dot, 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 plus negative 3 times 21, put that, sum them all up, and that number here is 48.6. Is that bigger than 0? If so, the answer is yes. So that's what a linear separator does. Two steps. <clears throat> One is the learning process, oh, I'm sorry, performance time. Once I learn the model, given a new instance, I can predict the label. But previously to this, at the learning time, I had a data set here. And from the data set, I try to find, I try to find these parameters. So that's what machine learning does. It, it, given a data set, it finds parameters, these weights. Given these weights, I can now give a value, give a label, yes or no, to a new, a new patient. So that was linear separators. And there's a whole bunch of techniques. One you may have seen about in the popular press are support vector machines. <clears throat> and let me describe what they're doing. Uh, so imagine here's my data. There's pluses and minuses, you know, uh, relapse and no relapse in this linear model. And now let me imagine there's several linear separators I could consider having. Oops. So one would be this one. Notice. All the pluses are here, all the minuses are there. Oops, I want to go one by one. There's one. There's the second one. So there's another one, another thing which again has right properties. And here's another one, and here's another one, and here's it. So there's like, oh, sorry. Okay, so out of all these linear separators, here's an audience participation part of the talk. Which one would you pick? And again, I, I realize that there's no audience who can participate here, unfortunately. But most people would say, not the purple one. Why not? Well, look how close it is. It's right next to that to that red thing there. If this red thing was off by a little bit, I'd have a different value. And, and, and not this brown one, because again, the same thing as touches another point. The one most people would be happiest with is a green one. Why? Because it's far away from all the other points. It means it's robust, right? If this point were to move a little bit, the green would still give it the same label. It's not touching on a point. That notion can be said precisely. 
I'm going to define the margin of a line to points as a boundary from that point, that line to the nearest point. So it would be, for example, this point here and that point there. That's the nearest points. I want to maximize that minimum distance. I'm going to find the line that maximizes this margin. And that's exactly what support vectors do. They find the line which is the best line. Again, here you can visualize it in two-dimensional space, but the same idea applies to 100 or 1,000 dimensional space. You can fairly quickly find these, not just a separated line, but the one which is best, the one which is the one which is most robust. So linear separators, good news. <clears throat> if the data is linearly separable, if there's a line which puts plus here and minus there, then there's a fast algorithm that finds a set of weights, in fact, the one which is the most robust. That's the good news. Now for some bad news. People can see the figure here. Notice it's got two minuses and two pluses. And notice this proposed separator here doesn't qualify. Everything here is positive, And here, two things are negative, but it's also positive. So this doesn't qualify. So this is not doesn't separate the data because of this guy. But maybe if I was clever, I could find another one. And if, if you looked at that, you see no matter how that line was rotated around, it would still have you know, a plus on one side and a plus or minus on the other side, or maybe a minus on one part and a plus or minus on other parts. There's no, no place which had only pluses here and only minuses there. Bummer. Well, what about, what if I move it over? Maybe if I move it here? Well, no, because here there's, uh, so no matter how I move it, again, uh, um, turns out there's a simple proof. This data is not linearly separable. Remember I said, if it was linear separable, I could find it. Here, there's no linear separation. There is no line which puts pluses here and minuses there. And there's only two dimensions, only four points. And you still have counterexamples to this claim. So some data sets are not linearly separable. There are extensions to linear models that can cope with a small number of things outside or that fail. But there are other algorithms you can apply. apply. Another very intuitive one is decision trees or recursive partitioning functions. So <clears throat> given data like this, which you could probably see there's no line that cuts it correctly, you could first somehow, by some magic, split it based on, on the x-axis. And now you have two different sets. Is it, is it pure? Not yet. Let's try to keep splitting it. I'm going to split it again. And again, here, everything here is all negative, here it's all positive, here it's all negative. Here, I'm not quite done yet. Uh, I can, uh, it's still not all positive or all negative. But one more split, I could do, I could do better. And so this is a partition of space like this. And now there's a decision tree, a recursive partitioning function. If the temperature is more than 35, if the answer is, is no, I then, that's this part, I then ask, is the blood pressure greater than 80? And I make a decision yes or no on that basis. On the other hand, if it's greater than 35, I then ask about the blood pressure being greater than 70. I say no if it's less, and if it's positive, I then keep, I keep splitting. So again, simple, simple, made up example, but that's a decision tree. There are like five different fields, you know, <clears throat> within operations research and machine learning and statistics. We've all developed this simple notion of decision trees, and they work amazingly well for many classes of problems. Uh, there's issues of how do you split and when do you stop, how do you avoid overfitting, and blah, blah, blah. I actually have a little, a little web tool that, you can, that illustrates this, but that's decision trees. Now, you guys remember the question I asked earlier about, <coughs> about beta catenin in the junction, in, um, in the nucleus? You know, can we figure out a decision tree for who will have a relapse and who will not? And it turns out this was a tool that the, the, machine, the decision tree learning tool produced this as its outcome. And let me talk through this, right? Uh, this is basically, <clears throat> if there's any alpha catenin in the nucleus, remember, it shouldn't be there, right? It's supposed to be on the membrane. If, if any of the alpha catenin has gone rogue in the nucleus, if there's any of these, predict relapse. Good. What if there's no alpha catenin in the nucleus? Well, now look at the number of lymph nodes. If it's greater than zero, then predict a relapse. That's pretty intuitive. Okay. And now, what if the number of lymph number of alpha catenin nucleus was zero? Number of lymph nodes, number of lymph nodes is zero. And now for P10, right? If there's a large amount of P10, 
then no relapse. If there's some, if there's low concentration of P10, predict relapse. So P10 uh, sort of promote um, the absence of it leads uh, the, the the concentration promotes no relapse. Okay. But what if it's right in the middle? Well, now we ask about beta catenin nucleus, and now we can make decisions based on its concentration. So this would be a decision tree. This is a decision tree that our model learned. I didn't build it. The data itself led to this by a simple algorithm. And now let me point out, remember I mentioned beta catenin nucleus. Its correlation was zero in general, you know, negative 0.019. And yet there it is. So if I just focused on the features which are highly correlated with the outcome, I wouldn't have found this one. I wouldn't have produced this tree. So this was the decision tree that was learned in this particular case. Now, and there's many, many other algorithms. There's support vector machines with kernel tricks. And you probably heard about neural nets and deep learning, deep nets, and Bayesian classifiers, and k-nearest neighbors, and ensemble models. Again, I teach a semester-long class in machine learning, and that just scratches the surface. So there's a lot you can do with this foundation. Um, and you could predict true or false. You also could predict, you know, okay, middle, mid, mild sick, average sick, very sick. You can produce real values, all that in the same framework called regression around classification, and so forth and so on. So again, this is sort of the first part. This is just describing a class, what the problem is, what the class of algorithms is. Keep on ask questions. I'm not going to do that though. So let me go on. The question now is, did it work? I built a tool. I mean, anyone can build a tool. You know, did, is this a, a correct answer? Is this is this a tool that you should use for your patients so you can believe they're actually going to be effective? Let's talk about that now. What? How do you evaluate these systems? So let me start by saying, what is the goal of machine learning? So I've got data that I trained on. So one answer is, if I want to do well in the training set, well, that's trivial. I know for A, the answer is no. I know B, the answer is yes, and D, the answer is no. I'm done. That's not the goal. I don't want to just do well in the data I was trained on. I want to generalize the data I haven't seen yet. So I want to do well on unseen data. I want to do well on an, an example that comes with the same distribution, but I don't know the label at this point. That's the goal. So this seems weird, right? <clears throat> Again, I want to classify that predicts correctly on data, on data, on novel patients, but not on, but that novel patient is not one of the patients I trained on. How is that possible? The learner hasn't seen this data. Is it just guessing or is it magic? Right? It's not clear how this could work. Well, yes, it is. Let me talk about why it can work. So here's a little narrative, right? <clears throat> I open a medical clinic in Edmonton, and over the next year, I collect patients, and I look at, look at the outcomes. And I collect the big enoughs, and I, I call that set D for data set, and I have a learning algorithm that produces a classifier. And by construction, the classifier that I produce, this classifier C as a function of the learner applied to data, I want it to do well, maybe not perfectly, but I want to do well on the data it was trained on. So now, from the same medical clinic in Edmonton, after I train on it, I now have a new patient comes in. And now, let's consider two situations. Maybe this type of patient is common. Maybe this is a, a patient that occurs with some frequency. So make it more concrete. Suppose my data says 200 patients. If X is a type of patient that occurs 10% of the time, I probably have 20% of my patients look like X. Now, don't forget, my classifier, by construction, tries to do well on the data it was trained on. So if I've seen 20 patients look like this patient, if I got it wrong, that'd be a big hit. I would lose 10% accuracy just right there. So if my classifier does well on the data, that means it probably does well on these 20 patients in the data set, which means it's probably going to do well on this patient. So that's one situation. For common patients, I've probably seen someone like this patient before, which means there's a good chance this classifier will give the right answer. That's one situation. What about uncommon situation? Again, my data says 20 patients. Suppose X is a 1 in 10,000 case. Well, if, a, if I have a data set of size 200, 
I probably have no examples of a one in 10,000 case. Uh, for rare cases, you just can't do it. Let me point out that as you clinicians are practicing also, you go through a trial period where you, you see a bunch of cases and you might not have seen this very rare case when you were studying. And the textbooks may not include either because they just focus on you know, the most common cases in general. So if it's not in the data set, I haven't seen it, and so you might, might get it wrong. Well, I hate getting anyone wrong. That's not my goal. But if you had to choose, would you rather get a 10% case wrong or a 1 in 10,000 case wrong? And the answer is to build an effective classifier. If you had to choose, you'd rather get the most common cases. So get it. I make it sound like it's a choice. It's not a choice. That's just that's how statistics work. This is the foundation of all of statistical inference, that you build models, you draw samples from it, and you try to do well in the samples you draw on. And now when you test on from the same distribution, you probably will do well on that same situation. And situations you haven't seen, well, unfortunately, you might, they might not be correct. They might still get it right, but the guarantees are, are, are not there. That's just what happens. So normally this is, this is my machine learning while standing on one foot. <laughs> So with that in mind, how do you evaluate a classifier? So I could <clears throat> take the training data and train and build a classifier, and then use the same data to, to test it. Well, this is a problem. This is a training scenario, which is too optimistic. To illustrate why this is a bad idea, let me tell you a story. I, I didn't mention it. Today is, today is Thursday. I didn't mention there's actually going to be a test. Did, did you tell them that, uh, Jesse? Well, so, there's going to be a final on this work on Friday. Okay. So, and imagine on Thursday, today, Tuesday, I say, here is that final. I'm going to give you the thing I'm going to give you on Friday. Here it is right now. I give you that final. And I say, there you go. You get to look at it, study it, done, send it back. And now, Friday, I say, okay, here it is again. Here's the same test. So, you get to train on exactly the data you're going to be testing on. Does anyone think this is going to be a meaningful estimate of how well you know the material? I think not, right? You're going to be optimistic. You're going to just memorize what's there and do a good job, but not understand the ideas. This is why training on the test data is optimistic. It might be a meaningful measure of how well you understand what's going on or how well the learned algorithm can generalize is running to other data. What we should do instead was give you the final I gave two years ago, or the final that a colleague gives. Train on that. Understand this. This is a different test. It's related, but it's not the same thing. Study this. Send it back. And now, 2019, uh, last year's slide, sorry. I now give you the correct final. I give you this final. And now you've trained on data you weren't being tested on, but something similar to it. The same in my clinic has Edmonton patients circa uh, 2017, and now I've got Edmonton patients circa 2020. And assuming the patient population hasn't changed, which is a reasonable assumption, this is going to be a meaningful estimate. So now I think it will actually reflect what's going on. This is going to be a good estimate of how well you're going to do on data you haven't seen yet. So that's why I should divide the data into two different sets. I should train on some and test on the other. And that's, I think, a holdout set. Let me give you a variant to this, something called cross-validation. So this is a subtle point that people often get wrong. Let me go through it here. Here's my data set. I'm going to take the whole data set, put it into a learner, and produce a model, produce a decision tree, or produce a linear combination. Now, what I should do is take another data set and apply this learner to that and see what works. And that's great if I have you know, data set from Calgary or from another clinic in Edmonton. What if I don't? What if all I have was this, trend, this label data set here? That's all I get to play with. Now what do I do? Well, I want to return this classifier, but I also want to give you a certificate, how good it is, some notion of how well they will do a holdout set. So here's what you do. You divide the data into five parts, partition it, and now I'm going to do the following. I take four-fifths of the data, and I use that. I apply the same learning algorithm that I did for the whole data set, and I produce another model. It's a different model. You know, this one was, um, you know, this was a different decision tree. It's based on four-fifths of data, not the whole data set. 
But now I want to see how good this learner does. I wish I had another data set that looks just like this. Well, not exactly, but it's similar enough to it, but I didn't train on. Well, there it is. I can then apply, people can see my mouse, right? So I then apply this learn, the learned algorithm here to the data set I wasn't trained on. And sure enough, I can get a meaningful error of how well this learner does on this data set. That's one estimate. I can do this five times. I can look at this one also. Yeah, I, can take, I can hold this one out, hold this one out, hold that one out, hold that one out, and finally hold this one out. And now I can do the same thing. I can, I can build a learner based on this four-fifths of data and then evaluate that on data it wasn't trained on. So now every one of these is an honest estimate, a meaningful estimate of how well this learner does on, on a data set. On data that looks like S, but it's only four-fifths of it. I can use the average of this, and that's my certificate. I'm going to say, here's my learn, here's my learner, here's my decision tree, and here's my accuracy. It's 82%, it's 75%, or maybe it's 50%. Don't use it all, it's worthless. But I've got a good estimate of how well it would work. So with that in mind, I want to just make a quick contrast. Remember I mentioned this idea of taking just one feature at a time. So there's 30 features for that data set. I can look at <clears throat> just this resubstitution, or this is a cheating error. I get pretty good estimates, and I sort them by the different features that are available. But I can also get a five-fold cross-validation estimate. And we can see there's often some pretty big gaps that uh, my optimistic estimate looks really good. The reality is not quite so good. But you can see that it makes a difference whether I train on the right data or whether I train, whether I evaluate it correctly or not. OK, so back to the question I had earlier. Uh, how did my tools work? How did single features work? How did it support vector machines or decision trees or other things? And it turns out support vector machines did really well if you cheat, but reality wasn't quite as good. Decision tree algorithms actually did 79% in terms of it was actually 10 times tenfold cross validation. And we had a paper published, wow, <laughs> 11 years ago on this. So that was one example <clears throat> for sub cell localization of a protein and using that to build a classifier. Um, how much time do I have? It's, um, should I take another another 10 minutes, 5 minutes? Sure, yeah, 10 minutes would be great. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. good, thank you. So let's talk about, uh, so, about uh, metabolites. Okay. So um, I work with, Dave, I'm fortunate to work with Dave Wishart, who sort of set the stage for the whole world on, on human metabolome. So, now, metabolites are small, endogenous and exogenous chemicals that appear in non trivoquinian people. And they seem associated with diseases and, and treatments and so forth. Um, so one question, I work with Vicky Barakos, who you may know is a world expert in cachexia on muscle wasting for cancer. And so we had this question, could we predict which patients have cachexia? So we started with a patient, a different patient, by the way, take a urine sample, do an NMR spectrum, and then compute this profile. And now the question is, given this class, this profile, can we predict whether this patient have muscle wasting in a certain time frame? Yes or no? How do we do this as a profile? Well, she said, here's 74 other patients with 54. Here's a metabolic profile as patient. Can we predict who is, who is cachexia from this label data set? And we got an 82% accuracy. We published this 10 years ago. Um, that was kind of cool. Uh, what about colon cancer? Colonoscopy is a definitive test for adenoma, but it's expensive, time-consuming, uncomfortable. But there is this other test. Who's over 50, right? We know this, the poop test, right? The fecal occult blood test. It's icky, and there's lots of, of non-compliance. It's also not that accurate. So can we build a test that looks at urinary metabolites? So we actually did this. Here's a, here's a AUC curve, and we found that, that these three different uh, uh, fecal tests did poorly. We could do much better and also vary the uh, precision recall as we want from a data set. So that was a paper we did seven years ago. Uh, and there's a company, uh, Richard Fedorik, passed away recently, unfortunately, started a company called Metabolics Technology Institute. And they started, um, and the work was with them. And they had a license agreement and they used it in various US-based companies. And, and then back in May last year, it's now being rolled out in Edmonton. So soon we won't have to worry about this poop test, which is kind of nice for, for those of us uh, of the appropriate age. 
Um, so that's exciting news. Um, breast cancer. All right, about breast cancer. <clears throat> so what about uh, RNA, uh, messenger RNA? Right? So um, now what is this? Okay. Um, I got the bit wrong. I'll do this one. So <clears throat> again, as people in the audience probably know, there's this interesting phenomenon that um, we have, well, we have DNA which caught, which leads to, which gets expressed and leads to, and, and over development, we develop eyes and lungs and hearts and tissues and so forth and, and skin. But it's one blueprint. How is that possible? Well, different parts of blueprint are associated with the eyes and lungs and hearts and so forth. <clears throat> so a microarray, as people know, measures what part of the DNA are being read to distinguish different types of cells. Well, that's interesting, but not that relevant. Pathologists can do this pretty easily as well. But also a tumor might use other parts of DNA also. And different types of tumors may involve different regions of DNA being expressed or misexpressed. <clears throat> so breast cancer, as people I'm sure know, is really many, it's all an uncontrolled growth of cells in the breast tissues, but it's actually many different diseases with different ideologies, different treatments. Um, and the treatment depends on the disease, on the hormone receptor status. And so there's, as John Mackey points out, there's tamoxifen for your positive women, and trituzumab for HER2 neg for HER2 positive. And so what treatment you give depends on the hormone receptor status. Now, again, uh, uh, 12 years ago, there was some problems that overworked pathologists weren't always perfect, and they made some mistakes here. Can we help them? Can we give them a tool that can, uh, another tool in their arsenal that can predict, help them make diagnosis based on on the top on them on the gene expression values so we looked at a microarray analysis again i'll skip the details there's like 33,000 probes you know things like genes and other expressed uh, regions um we built a classifier for er positive or negative um of based on classifiers how do we do this well you know the story right i give you 160 individuals with 33,000 dimensional features, the gene expression values, as well as the labels, and we're able to predict it for that. Um, so I should point out that machine learning knows a lot about, you know, if you give me thousands of patients and hundreds of descriptions, I know how to do that. Turn this sideways, I have high dimensional data, if there's 160, 160 individuals with 33,000, we need other tricks, large P, small n. So again, I'll skip the details, we found lots of different tools for doing this. Bottom line, we got really good results. We got a, a paper seven years ago. I was on the news with John Mackey doing this work. Cool stuff for predicting ER receptor status. Uh, I'm going to skip, 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 um, uh, skip SNPs, skip brain tumors to go psychiatric diagnosis. Okay. Um, and again, um, psychiatrists know that many psychiatric disorders look very similar. Depression and bipolar present the same but very different treatments. You need a mood elevator for depression, so mood stabilizers for bipolar. But if from first presentation, you're not exactly what to do. There's also very built in a population. What works well for a patient diagnosed with depression, one patient may not work for others, right? There's SSRIs and, and, and uh, CPT and so forth. Which one's best? Can we use an objective measure like MRI, fMRI to distinguish disorders to find the best treatments? So I've done a bunch of work with the Department of Psychiatry as well as colleagues from IBM um, to do this work. Um, uh, gee, I'm running out of time. Um, we did a study for ADHD. Uh, there was a competition where they gave us data with, with both patients and controls from eight different centers from resting state fMRI data. Um, we also gave us phenotype, phenotypical features to try to predict could we do well on a data set that was a holdout that wasn't part of our training sample. And it turns out it was great. We won. Well, we actually ignored the imaging data. We took other data, and they disqualified us. But but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> we know that some of the issues was why resting state, why high dimensionality, batch effects, lots of issues. I can talk about later on if there's questions. Um, but we got papers out of it, and we have advanced the state of the art about how to use MRI scans, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance, to do better and better on this type of data over the years. Ooh, I'm out of time. So we also look at functional cognitivity about different parts of the brain. So again, this is a every part of the brain, there's going to be a waveform. So this this part has a bold signal, looks like that. Another part of the brain 
has another signal, we can look at how they correspond or how they're related. And this is functional connectivity. Some have very strong correlations like, like, like uh, V1 and V3, whereas these ones look very different. So skip, skip, skip. We can do clever things and get really good accuracy. Um, oh, and I've got, I've got some eye candy here that just shows parts of brain that seem involved with this. Um, okay, papers on this. We've done some other work with um, another tool for looking at fMRI studies for schizophrenia from never diagnosed patients, I'm sorry, diagnosed from never treated. Uh, skip the details. Bottom line is it worked. They got some, some papers. Uh, we just were on German TV a few months ago about this cool stuff. I'm going to skip diabetes. Skip diabetes, go to foundations. Uh, I assume people know Kaplan-Meier curves. This is a curve for a population. Um, it's often misused because it was never designed for an individual. But people say, well, gee, so the, the median time is 11 months. Oh, I'm glad you don't smoke, so maybe a bit longer. Oh, I wish you weren't overweight. It's not designed for, it's for a population of individuals. Can we do better for individuals? So here's a way we took two individuals. So this was Kaplan-Meier for stage four stomach cancer patients, 128 sub individuals. Can we do better? So here are two patients, both stage four stomach cancer, but we have another uh, 35 features, including various blood factors. And we can make predictions for these different patients, build a, a curve for this individual. So this individual, instead of 11 months, we think this patient's going to live for twice as long, for 22 months or so. So we're pretty accurate there. And here's another patient, again, stage four stomach cancer, and we predict this patient should be in hospice now because this patient, unfortunately, has two months to live, and we were correct again. Okay, so we've done this for looking at, I'll stop that, for looking at a, at a, a tumor, a, who should be waitlisted for tumor, for liver transplants, and again, we can predict which patient uh, has a better chance of long-range survival based on race factors. Um, oh, I'm going to skip this one. About we hoping we can help people understand how lifestyle issues might help people delay the onset of breast cancer. Um, again, preliminary work there. Um, I'm going to skip this. I'm going to jump right to the end. <clears throat> um, I was introduced as being one of the founders of the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. We're a multi-million dollar institute with about two million dollars a year from the Alberta government, as well as this new federal program. We're getting about five million dollars a year from the federal government to promote machine learning, computational finance. But my interest is machine for health informatics and many other topics. We're looking for collaborators, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, let me wrap up by saying I'm a computer scientist. None of this would happen if I didn't have world-class collaborators for all these different topics. I'm very fortunate to be in Alberta to have great people to play with, world-class individuals who know about diabetes and liver transplants and colorectal, colorectal cancer and so forth. Um, summary, association studies, these correlation studies are very useful. Um, I didn't mean to say negative about them. They're great for finding causal connections and decide what to knock out and amplify good stuff, but they're not designed to predict patient outcome for new individuals. If you want to do that, you need a predictive study. And machine learning provides tools for that, and that's necessary for producing patient-specific treatments. And machine learning provides those tools. It's critical for bioinformatics and bioinformatics. Um, skip that. I just want to say that if you're interested, that's how to reach me. And this URL will point to another to other versions of talks like this and some other things. And I'll stop there. Thank you for your thank you for your, your patience and I look forward to questions. Uh, there's a few questions in, and I'll probably go from uh, bottom up. Which uh, tools or languages do you use to build the decision tree? Um, I think it's more broadly. What tools or, or languages do you do you find that you usually uh, uh, test uh, and leverage? That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer. Uh, <laughs> I love the answer I heard a few years ago, which is the tool you should use is the one you're most familiar with. If you know about decision trees, you know how to get them to bend to your will. You know, SVM, you can do it. If you've got lots of data and you're very clever, smarter than I am, then you can get deep learning tools to work. Um, but that takes a large amount of data. And the, the big success is the first examples I showed were almost all of them were related to something like imaging. And they use clever, clever ideas from, they use deep learning to try to understand two or three dimensional data points. But uh, what language to use, um, you yeah. know, 
the other thing that's really nice about today, uh, again, I use the metaphor of driving a car. If you want, machine learning has got the point now when using machine learning is kind of like driving a car. You take a small course and you can do it. Now, that doesn't mean you can fix deep problems in a car. You've got a mechanic to do that. It doesn't mean you can design new cars, but using it, there are tools right now that you take your data, you do a little massaging to it, you put it in, and it comes back and it says 82% 5 4 cross validation accuracy. Is that good enough for you? No, okay, let's try this other tweak. And now maybe you get went from 82%, no, that tweak made it only 78%. So maybe the first one was better. So there are ways to do pretty well, even for people who are not machine learning aficionados. That's ways to get started pretty easily. Great question. Um, next question is, uh, mm -hmm. who validates the data outcomes? Who validates? Okay. Yeah, sure. Well, um, that's interesting you mentioned that. There's, it's one of my hobby horses these days. Is um, Actually, I think I mentioned it over here. It's one of these points here about having uh, verifiable labels, right? Many machine learning tools try to match, for example, uh, lesion scores. And the lesion score is a person. A person has assessed it. So this lesion score is, is three. And another person says, oh, no, actually, it's four. I'm, well, I'm older than you are, so it's three. So we use that. It's completely based on a human in the loop. And doctors do a great job. But it's so much nicer to do something like um, you know, three year, um, you know, three uh, relapse, you know, where you have a, an objective measurement that two different clinicians will both agree that the number, that the count of this type of cell in the blood was less than a certain threshold. Done. They're objective measures. So I like having objective measures of these studies and promoting those. Um, and now it doesn't matter what this clinician or that clinician says, it's just a measure. I talked about survival analysis, I hate to mention, but death is a pretty definitive, unequivocal issue. Yes, you can say, did he die of a car accident or did he die of, you know, of the disease? But the module of that is definitive. So who validates it? Well, hopefully it's not a who, but it's a data set that validates it. There's a, a data set which has the individuals and a label. And that label is not based on, on a person's opinion, but it's based on something which is objective. Many data sets are not based on that right now. and I'm promoting this objective measure. Hope that answers the question. Um, next question is, uh, can you share uh, your experience in leveraging unlabeled medical data and incorporating it into the learning process? Ah, good question. Um, I've got lots of experience in that. Uh, so one, one body of interesting tools is uh, I've got labeled data and unlabeled data. Um, maybe it'd be really nice to know a label of a particular point. Could I have active learning where I've got unlabeled data, but I also have a budget. Someone says, you know, here's, you know, uh, Dr. Smith will label a, a point for you if you give it to him, but, but he charges, a, you know, $10 per label. And here's $100, so I get 10 questions asked. Which 10 questions do I ask him? So that's not quite your question. That's saying I can get unlabeled data, but pick the one which is the one closest to a boundary, right? I've built a boundary here, and there's a point there this one's positive, this point's negative. A point right there, well, that might make a difference. So you know, your question about unsupervised or, or semi-supervised learning, often there are ways to I get a better model of, of P of X, right? Of producing a label given description of individuals. Can I get a better model of what X looks like? Can I find how, it, how it's shaped and then use that to try to figure out more information? Again, take my class. You know, I, I, do, I do spend several lectures talking about this. But the simple description is there are ways to do it that basically you learn a model, not P of Y given, it's not the label given in instance, but where are the data points? Where, where are they distributed? Give me an understanding of, of what the where the points are local, localized. And now I want to make sure I get these points right at the perhaps sacrifice of points at the low probability of parts of the space. Other questions? Great. Um, one, one question I have is what is one area in machine learning that most excites you? Huh. I mean, personally, well, I mean, I'm excited by the fact that it works. <laughs> I mean, I've been in machine learning now for 30, 35 years, and there's been lots of stories and fanciful, fanciful tales. And we can do this, and look, I made up a data set, and look, it did so well on the data set I made up. Boy, I'm brilliant. But now, we didn't make up the data. <laughs> Someone said, you know, doctor said, here's a problem. Can you solve it? And we're making advances. We actually are solving problems. I'm excited by the fact that, one, a lot of problems are solvable. We get good answers. 
And that's great. I'm also excited by problems you don't get good answers on because I'm a researcher. This is exciting to play with. The survival prediction stuff. I now have survival, survival prediction color glasses. Every problem people hand me is, you know, will this patient get, get cancer? No, wrong, wrong question. Now, I'm a man, I've got prostate cancer right now. I guarantee, you know, as every other person with a Y chromosome does. Is it gonna cause me any problems? That's, that's a more relevant question. So if I predict that for me right now, if the time until I get prostate cancer is another 50 years, I'm not gonna worry about it. something else will knock me before then. And I think this idea of looking at time until an event, time until death, time until relapse, time until recovery, time until re-injury, time until onset, these are questions which are very exciting questions. And the methodology, the mathematics is interesting. And damn it, it works. And that's really exciting. So I'm excited by things that work and they're interesting problems. And uh, I guess one, one last question is, in the context of research, as we progress and our, the, the technology and the experience <clears throat> develops in machine learning, uh, we'll, we'll probably see, we're, we're going to need to see that research operationalized in healthcare in Alberta faster. Mm -hmm. And I guess what tips do you have for us in, in, in doing that um, to, to take the research that's being done that obviously you've shown is, is pretty impressive mm -hmm. in operationalizing it? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> let me divide two different sets of issues. One is, does it work? And the second is, can we deploy it? So I'm focusing here, right? Building tools mm -hmm. and saying, I've got 82% cross-validation accuracy. I understand how it extends and, and, and goes other ways. This other question, can I get FDA approval? And that's a long, complicated process. Can I explain it? Oh, that's another long path I got opinions about, but that seems an important characteristic. Um, can we get, doctors to adopt it, okay? All the things, again, I, I worked with enough clinicians that I, I remember one of my friends said, you know, I do surgery, I don't have time to pee. You want me to do more work for you? And I know the answer is no, he's not gonna do it. Can I build a tool that will make his life, his or her life better in ways which is, leads into, which doesn't cause more work or more energy from this clinician who really has to solve has to save people's lives, right? And I don't take that, I take that seriously. Can we make a tool that's gonna to be effective to use for them? Can we make them, convince them it's gonna be effective? Can we then also deploy it in ways that doesn't mean, oh, again, I mean, I, I know about, you know, AHS rolling out this new- um, Can I care? Can I care, right? Which is a great idea, but there's a huge transition cost. And I know every clinician I talk to says, oh my God, yeah, I don't have to pee, and I gotta learn this also, right? <laughs> And so clearly you have to find ways to make it accessible, to make it, to make it not just work and convincingly work, but also make it so it's, it does require a clinician who's already overworked to have to learn a whole new methodology. You can build tools which are a simple website you go to, you put in five factors and it comes out with a tool. So the, the tool I mentioned for helping um, hepatologists decide about liver transplants who, sh who should be waitlisted, that's a tool. You go online, you click, put a few numbers in, it gives you this plot, it gives you some statistics about it. Uh, one thing I've done, which I've noticed many other machine people haven't done, is I work with clinicians. I don't say, here's a problem I wanna solve, come play with me. They say, Russ, here's a problem I wanna solve, can you help me? And if I solve it, then they're already committed because that's a problem that they came with. So I think, I'm I have a talk, I talk to machine learning people, which I say, look at the problem and try to solve that. Mm -hmm. And then the technologies, well, I don't really understand what junctional proteins are, and I never will. And I don't really understand what SNPs or microarrays really do. I don't have to, I've got colleagues who are world class in this. You clinicians don't really understand what overfitting means and regularization terms and how to use um, hypergeometric functions and things, it doesn't matter. I understand that, and you, you can trust that I can understand it and get the right answers. Could we get a synthesis where we work together, where you tell me a problem to solve, and that's your job, is what's the problem, how do you evaluate it? It's another important issue. And my job is actually finding tools which match that. I should, I should have said also, uh, when, you come to, when you come to a, a machine learning person, people in the audience, it's important to say, here's a problem I wanna solve. And again, there'll be a dialogue, but what exactly do you wanna do, and how are you gonna evaluate it? Someone says, here's my data set, come play with me. I can't help with that. Here's my data set, here's a question I want. That's a start. How do you evaluate it? 
well, I want to get everyone right. I do too. It's not going to happen. How, how do I, what's the, what's the cost of false positive and false negative? Are they the same cost? If it's telling someone who's, who's sick, you're healthy, go home. What's the cost of doing that? Versus the cost of saying, I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith, you do have cancer, but actually it turns out I was wrong. These, these are both bad situations, but how bad are they? How do you match them? And I think a lot of clinicians, I'm, everyone has a hard time answering this question, but if you can quantify the problem at that level, that helps me a lot. And that's the direction to go in, right? To start by saying, and be a dialogue saying, well, how bad are false positives and false negatives? What's a population you want to look at? I want to work for anyone in the whole world. I want this to be a perfect tool for everyone. Well, okay. Then I need data from everyone in the world. I need data from India and China and Vietnam and Africa. I don't have that. I got data from Edmonton. Great. I'll build you a tool for Edmonton. But I want to work for everyone in the world. I know you want to. <laughs> Statistics 101 says, you train on a population. Some of the slides I skipped talk about this. You train on a population, it's going to apply to that population potentially. Well, apply to other populations, it might, but all bets are off. It's not a statistical question at that point. You have to understand other factors. That was a long rambling answer with several different points, but I think it's very exciting. There's lots of opportunities. Uh, I haven't yet spoken to a doctor who had a data set that I would say, well, I'm sorry, it's not a machine learning question. It might be a machine learning question I can't help you with, but if you've got data, you want to find patterns and use that for some diagnostic or screening or prognostic or even disease management question, machine learning has tools for all those. So true. Yeah. And I think leaving with clinician led is, is a great place to, 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 to end the discussion. And I mm -hmm. appreciate your input and uh, what a great presentation. Thanks so much, Russ. My pleasure. If any questions, that's how to reach me. Thank sure. you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.